You're listening in on an animated discussion about Superman the Animated Series with two experts in their fields. I'm Joshua Unruh, superhero scholar. And I'm Caleb Masters, your friendly neighborhood film critic extraordinaire from the Cinematropolis.com. And today's topic is the first meeting of Superman and Batman in the DC Animated Universe. That's right, we're talking about the Superman the Animated Series episode, three-parter, World's Finest. And Joshua, I have to say, this has been one of the episodes that I've been looking forward to talking about since the day we we started this podcast. <laughs> they set the bar for first meetings in every other media right here. I'm not sure there's a better comic book first meeting than this. It's very good. No, it, it's, it's uh, exceptional. And I think the way that it brings these two different universes and shows together in a crossover feels organic and uh, something we'll talk a, uh, about a little more later, really, I think, sets the tone. And I don't know if this was intentional or not, but this is what kind of set like the technique that Marvel would later apply to the MCU. Intentional or not, I think it works very similar. But we'll, t- we'll touch on that later. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I like that. Um, one quick comic book note before we jump into the designs. For anyone who is wondering why this is called World's Finest, traditionally... That is what team-ups between Batman and Superman are called. They are the world's finest team. This actually comes from the fact that they were appearing in the same comic book together, in a, and it was called World's Finest Comics. Now, the thing is, they would appear together, Batman, Robin, and Superman, on the cover, but it was years before they actually appeared together in stories. They just had their own stories inside world's finest so you get a batman and robin story then you get a superman story so for a long time the only place they appeared together was on the cover of world's finest but eventually the writers of that comic figured out that they should actually have them team up <laughs> it's uh i i like that it's like a sub brand right like people who knew i want my batman superman story could pick up a world's finest comic and know and i also appreciate that uh, Bruce Tim, Paul Denny, and gang decided to name this after that same comic so that it, it's one of those, I think, for people who hadn't read the comics, it just was like a catchy title. But for people who had read yeah. the comics, you know, going into the episode, you're like, ooh, this is going to be a really cool story. Uh, and what a first story it was. Oh, my goodness. Um, Joshua, do we want to just kick off the conversation by talking a little bit about the designs again? Yeah, I think that's a must. And, uh, you know, as a as a programming note to our listeners, both in Last Son of Krypton and also World's Finest, they introduce so many new characters. So it is going to take us a minute to kind of go through these, but we do feel like it's really worth looking at these. And a lot of them are not massively changed. You know, some of them are, are really basic changes, but we still want to talk about that. But if you're feeling like our design discussion is a little long, Let me assure you it's a self-solving problem because after we talk about the majority of these characters, we'll only have two or three in every episode after this. Well, and and I think it's um, I think it's good that we're kind of this really opens uh, up the conversation for us to talk about the redesign because there are some you mentioned some of the characters didn't have big changes, but other characters had massive changes. And we're going to touch on, I think, a couple of those uh, in a moment. Uh, But also this represents this episode represents the, the coming together of Batman and Superman. And the reason we're doing this after Superman the animated series is to kind of set the tone that we are now going to be tackling uh, the Batman redesign, also known as the new Batman adventures, uh, which is all designed the same way Batman is in the world's finest. Uh, So we'll kind of be going back and forth between Superman, the animated series and Batman, the animated series uh, kind of moving forward. So I think that opens the conversation to Batman redesign. This is where we have a whole new look for Batman that looks a lot more consistent with what uh, they did with Superman, the animated series. Uh, Joshua, who who would you like to start with on this one? Well, I think that we can kind of set the tone, actually, with the first two Batman characters we see with Harley and Joker. They're the first two we see on screen, and I feel like they are very typical of the here is a good redesign and here is a very very bad redesign <laughs> um you know joshua I'm, I'm glad yeah we just gotta get this out this is the elephant in the room uh i for me uh 
I think you're right. This, this represents the redesign as a whole. Harley, a little more streamlined, uh, a simplified color palette. She's a little slimmer. Uh, I think a really uh, nice redesign that allows these characters all to live in the same universe, but also still very uh, in line with what we saw in Batman, the animated series with the original animation mm -hmm. versus the Joker, which is like, holy crap. What, what, the, why doesn't he have lips? That's one of his like signature things is the, is the, the glossy lips, the lipstick. I, yeah, it's, um, he's shorter than you would expect. Uh, his hair is black with kind of green sometimes. Oh boy. Uh, it's what? really bad. It's the Joker bad. design is aggressively awful, and everybody can just at me. I don't care. It's really bad. No, no, um, it's bad. I, I have no no argument there. It is probably in my mind. We're gonna go th and we'll be talking about this uh, for you know for the next several weeks uh, as we talk about all the new characters. I think he's the worst. It's it's sad being one of Batman's most iconic and most used villains, but I think he's among at least top three, if not number one, the worst redesigned character because it's just all the the trait. Other than Mark Hamill's voice, most of the traits that we love about the Joker are just stripped away here. It's really true. I mean, you mentioned the loss of the lips, which I think is huge. It sounds like a ridiculous thing for us to get hung up on, but this is the Joker and he has no big red smile. It's messed up. I don't like it. And what this palette shift does for the rest of his outfit is also very bad. The the faded but darker purple next to this kind of lime green, it kind of makes the whole thing look sickly instead of clownish. You know, I, it's not... I don't like it. It is a number one, the worst redesign in the whole in the whole thing. I, there's nobody worse. Most people get better or at least stay the same. Right. But it is notable that our two kind of biggest characters in the new Batman adventures, Joker and Batman, get really bad redesigns. I'm jumping the gun a little bit throwing Batman in there, but we I, just got to lay it out. These I, I, two guys are number one and number two with a bullet. So I will say, uh, I do not think, I 100% I agree with you on Joker. Like, I have no argument. Like, it's one of those, you kind of forget, man, uh, I do think this is a bigger conversation. They redesign again when we get to uh, both, uh, we, when we get to the era of when they do use Joker and Batman Beyond Return of the Joker uh, yes. and Static Shock and Justice League. There's another design there that I love that kind of yeah, marries. Yeah, they figured it out. They figured, they it, figured out there, it out there. Yeah. Marrying kind of this design with the older design that I think works really, really well. But this design, oh my God. I, I'm not joking, Josh. When I bought the Blu-rays, one of the first things I did uh, for the Batman the animated series was I popped in the DVD. I was like, surely they... Uh, Gave him limps back, right? I'm not joking. I was like, hey, maybe give him limps back. <laughs> you and, you and hoped no, against hope. I did, yeah. and I was I was very disappointed. But um, I know Batman. On the other hand, um, I, I I don't dislike Batman as much as you. I don't think it's great. It's I boring. Do, it's it's just boring. Yeah, yeah. It's he's a little okay. It's another one of those things where I I do feel like I don't hate this one. It's just kind of eh. But I do think they take a lot of the changes here uh and again marry what we had from the original animation with this one and we get something better in justice league that i think is yes, awesome yes so that's true. this is kind of like a stepping stone but yeah it's definitely a step down from the original design absolutely and and so i'm clear to anyone who's like why is josh so horrified by the batman redesign you'll notice that the colors between the new batman adventures and superman are flattened out compared to the hand-drawn, airbrushed look of Batman the Animated Series. I don't think that's inherently a bad idea. I think that works for a lot of people. Look at Harley, you know. Um, in our next episode, we're gonna talk about that, the first episode of the new Batman Adventures, and it works stunningly for someone in there that you might not expect it to. But when you do this with just like black and gray, it's just so flat that that all of a sudden your hero is literally the least interesting thing. He's better in silhouette all the time because is, you're not yes. noticing how boring the rest of the outfit is. I, I, you know, I, 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 I do not want to jump the gun, but we're going to talk about the use of silhouettes in, the, in our follow-up episode on Holiday Nights. Yes, and yes. where I, 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 I think the strength of design shines in those areas, but in this, in this particular episode, especially where there's basically none of that, I, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly great. 
I'm also going to say that I am a massive proponent of the yellow oval bat shield and losing that always makes it look like a much lazier design to me every single time. Like it, it almost doesn't matter what you do with the bat. It just looks lazy. Even when Alex Ross does his painted ones, it seriously looks like he cut the black bat out of construction paper and glued it to his chest. It's not good. It needs something to set it off. Sure, and I'm, okay, so I'm less bothered about that, P. I mean, the yellow does give it a certain dimensionality that I appreciate. What bothers me more, though, I, I hate that it looks like a fat thing that's just sitting on his chest, you know? like Right. It's, it, it just, it looks weird. I I like the one that's a little wider, you know what I mean? Um. Oh, here, you know when you're on PowerPoint and you've got an image and you try to, like, change the, uh, when, when you're not you know, doing Photoshop or anything, and you try to like shrink the uh, an image and you sometimes squeeze it and make it look really fat, yeah. chubby, and dish- yeah. that's what it looks yes. like. And it's like, that's the part about this. I mean, the yellow would have been nice, but that's that piece in particular. Like it looks gross. It just looks like sloppy, honestly. And right. again, I want to say, and Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the Justice League design that we'll talk about down the road still sticks with the black one, but uh, it doesn't look like a fat, saggy bat on his chest that's like, just kind of slapped on there the justice league outfit is much better we will get to it but they do not bring the oval back and i mean look there are differing opinions about the oval the oval is shockingly kind of full of tension when it comes to conversation so i recognize that with a certain swath of bat fans i'm being extremely controversial but the real fact is it looks like garbage every time there's not an oval until the most recent costume redesign um in rebirth the dc rebirth suit is very very good i still prefer the oval but what they do by yellow outlining like they just do a yellow outline of the bat is is better okay but you're you're always gonna lose me sans oval and part of it is that it's just not visually striking there's nothing to stick out of a black and gray blob so All right, I am now done beating that horse, thank God. But for real, it is bizarre to me that of all the redesigns we get, the Batman and Joker ones are easily the two worst. Granted, one of them is legit terrible and the other one is just boring, but still, it's not good. I am just going to speculate. There is no insight whatsoever uh, in into this take. Uh, there is, by the way, a fun little... Sp- if you have the DVDs or the Blu-ray set for Batman the Animated Series, so not not actually with World's Finest, but if you have those sets, there are, is a special feature, I think, in one of the sets uh, and in the, the whole uh, series Blu-ray where they talk about decisions, the, the, the rationale for the redesign, and I, mm-hmm. I definitely am not on... I, I did not buy their Joker Batman look uh, looks at all. <laughs> I, I suspect, though, the reason these are the two most popular characters. I bet more than any of the other characters, this is the one that there were all sorts of executives or like senior oh. leaders like looking at it and weighing it. Yeah. I need him to be this way. And, and then someone would say, I want him this way. And so what you end up with is uh, something that's just, well, Joker's just straight up bad. Uh, and that I, I don't have rational. But for Batman, I just feel like he's kind of meh. And it's probably yeah. because yeah. I bet they had so many opinions. It was almost a too many cooks in the kitchen. Again, purely speculation, but knowing how much people think uh, about how Batman looks and knowing the number of, of uh, people that have to give feedback on something like this before it goes on television. Sure. I bet that that was part of the problem, if I had to guess. That makes a lot of sense. Another thing that I have read is that they tried to redo all of the characters with only two colors Ugh. in their in their look, right, in their palette. And I that's why Joker lost his lips. There's no other red in him. And, uh, and that's an interesting design challenge. And again, it really does work for most of the characters. But I mean, I think you're seeing it fall apart with no lips for Joker. And they already have yellow in their utility belt for Batman. So there's really no, there's really no excuses here. So. No, I mean, and if, hey, if you're going to make an exception, I think the Joker's, you know, Batman's yes. arch nemesis is okay to kind of bend the rules a little bit. I don't, I don't uh, know. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. Now. We also have a whole bunch of redesigns that are pretty basic, really, but still 
land in a positive light, I think. Jim Gordon is one of these. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think uh, most of the Gotham PD looks turns out pretty well with this one. Uh, yeah, Gordon looks, he's a simplified version of what we've seen before, but I, I think it's consistent. I recognize him. It still looks and sounds like Jim Gordon. Uh, I think the, all the browns, kind of the brown color palette for him works. Uh, brown and white, I guess. Brown, maybe light brown or yellow and white hair, gray hair. All that worked. I think, it worked. I think he turns out pretty well, uh, honestly. My only feeling about him is that compared to his BTAS design, he looks like he's been sick, like he's oh. lost weight, <laughs> you know? Um, it doesn't look bad. It just when you compare the two of them, I'm like, he looks like he had the flu for like two weeks for two weeks before lost he th 30 pounds yeah yeah he just because he somehow looks a little thin and a little dumpy at the same time and it's again it's not bad it's still recognizably jim gordon but it's just that's a shift you know from his very like stocky i am ready to punch some dudes you know btaz design you know i think that's a, par uh, a fair point and again uh observational not necessarily like me saying ah this is why they did this but I think it's interesting that they, uh, outside of just the colors and streamlining those looks, they really did go through and modify the stature of a lot of these characters. Uh, so here we have, I think, Gordon and the Joker shrunk down, uh, are both shorter sure, and yeah. skinnier than they were in the previous design. I think Bullock actually, you know, if we want to segue into that, it might even be a little, might be a little bigger, actually. Um, I so, think that's true. I think they both Bullock up for real. Um and that's really the biggest change about him. Again, he looks like if it's one of those things, like if you were just passively watching it, you probably wouldn't even notice the difference with Bullock. You know, he's pretty, he's a little bigger. He's, his look is a little more streamlined, but I, I think it's like, he just, he looks very consistent. And I think it works, works pretty well for him. Yeah, yeah, I have no complaints about Bullock. I, I mean, I could point out a bunch of differences, but they're not bad differences. They're just the kind of a difference you would expect when you are, getting two shows to have the same look you know it's it's good it just feels like a very successful adaptation this is what this is what you're looking for you know like hey it looks like the same guy we made some small changes that you know people are going to pick up on i if they're watching closely but you know at the end of the day i think the goal i would think for them would be to adapt the animation across the board so that viewers aren't really thinking about it that much if I had to guess. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think we get the same thing in Alfred, right? I mean, simplified, but still basically Alfred. A lot of good choices there. Yeah. 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 Uh, again, I would say maybe another one of those characters they made a little skinnier. True. But, you know, when you think about it in those terms, everybody fell into about three body types yes. on BTAS. Yes. And one nice thing about the redesign and the changes in the way that they decided to animate these two shows is that you do get to vary it up a little bit. Um, so that's not a complaint. I, I agree with you, but I, I think that's a, that's a solid move. Whereas before he fell into thin type A, you know, and so did everybody else that wasn't big enough to be Batman or fight crime. Right, right, right. And uh, by the way, this is not a complaint. I, I But I think looking at this new design, it's also worth noting that they did the same thing here. There's a few, oh, I would, I don't know, I need to I haven't, do, a, do a count of it, but I would say there's probably three or four main body types because you have your heroes and your big thugs who are the big blocky type guys. And then you've yes. got a lot of the kind of smaller, skinnier ones. Women look a very specific way in this. Uh, yes. Uh, so much so that, well, I don't want to jump the gun. So much so that in in this batch of episodes, I mis mistook one woman for a totally different woman who we know. And I was like, <laughs> oh, because she looks so similarly. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And then let's look at one more big redesign for Gotham before we move on to Metropolis. And that is Gotham's favorite son, Bruce Wayne. Yeah, so um, I think we need to touch on this a little more because, firstly, streamlined design. Um, he, yeah, he looks, bo yeah, boring. He looks boring. Like, I, I don't think it's bad. I do kind of dig the blockier look. Like, when you see him working out in this episode, I'm like, all right, he's like, a, he's pretty ripped dude. That's pretty cool. But, uh, like, and when he's in his suit and all that, I don't, I don't know. He reminds me of a... Uh, Another animated program at the time, uh, Powerpuff Girls. Do you know the the scientist dad? Yes. Like that's yeah. how his, his chin looks pretty similar. You know what I mean? Like it's it's pr I, so I don't know. It, he just looks all right. I, I and uh, the the, the I, I don't know if we want to touch on the the voice change. He does still do the voice switching a little bit here, 
But um, maybe just not to the same degree we've come to expect in the original B task. But I did notice. I did. I did. I did listen carefully. He does code switch, and it's really weird when he's in Bruce Wayne outfit and he's talking to like Clark. He switches to Batman voice, like while he's yes. still. It's really <laughs> funny, and like I was like, I hope no one else was listening because that'd be kind of awkward. <laughs> I yes. So I actually agree that the look is kind of boring, but I think it's boring in the right way. Because remember what our very interesting Bruce Wayne looked like on BTAS? He wore a mustard colored suit. Right. You know? Um, yeah. And so streamlining that into like black suit, power tie, I like that. It is not visually striking, but I'm cool with it. He, he, he looks like a guy who could run a boardroom now when before he, you know, it didn't look like his clothes quite fit all the time. Sure. And, the voice is a number one with a bullet, the biggest loss by far. It is more of a switch than none, but it is not as big a switch as it used to be on BTAS. And I think going forward, I am going to complain about that a lot. I think it's a real loss to the character because they keep shaving that difference off as we go. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that's a mistake. And part of the reason I think it's a mistake is I really like when he's doing Batman stuff as Bruce Wayne and he switches into the Batman voice. That is a really interesting, right? you know, juxtaposition of the image and what you're hearing. And it's also why I think they missed a big opportunity on Superman doing at least some kind of something. Voice uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah. That, that, that is a thing that continues to stick out to me uh, watching the show is like, OK, the whole point of Clark Kent is that no one would suspect him to be Superman because of how different he acts. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. Not, not this Clark Kent. I mean, he he's not like obviously acting like Superman, but like he just seems like I don't know. He could eat. I, he, his body type's the same. His voice is the same. He's got glasses. That that's it. that's it. Right. You know? Yeah. And it's yeah. And so I, the voice change in Bruce Wayne is not what it ought to be, in my opinion, and that this reflects poorly on Superman, the animated series, is sort of an extra negative check, you know, against it. So oh, Yeah, kind of reminding us, why doesn't Superman have a different voice for his... his yes! Tale? Yes, and maybe that's why they keep shaving that change as they go, is to draw less attention to it. I don't know. Again, that's very much a, just making guesses, but... Well, and I also want to note, just, I, and this is a good, uh, maybe a challenge for listeners as well, uh, uh, as well as for us, how much do we see Bruce Wayne out of Batman costume when he's talking to the citizens of Gotham? Because I feel like some of the Bruce Wayne stuff we're going to see in uh, the new uh, Adventures slash Batman animated se the series uh, redesign is he's talking to the Bat family a lot more or people who know he's Batman. Sure. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't I just I'm curious to see, like, how much screen time is actually necessary for him to swap the voice. I know there's going to be some, but thinking about it, I see I feel like we either see him in costume most of the time or. Or he's around, he's Bruce Wayne outfit with people he knows. Like That's a good thing Batman. for us to keep an eye on. I yeah. agree. That's worth keeping an eye on. Definitely. Making a move to Metropolis. The first person we see in Metropolis in these episodes is also another kind of Harley Quinn, Renee Montoya type character. Mercy Graves. Mercy Graves is great. I, I, I just want to talk about, one, I think this outfit is both simultaneously 90s-tastic, fitting, and somewhat iconic. I can you um elaborate for me a little bit. I want to say it wasn't Mercy an invention for this show. Yes, that's what I mean by being like Harley and Montoya. She existed only for Superman the animated series, and it was a while before she showed up in any comic books, and she didn't really stick. She's been around some, but she hasn't really stuck. She's actually been in charge of Les Corp now and then. But again, it didn't really stick because comic book Lex just does not have need for a Mercy Graves uh, in the same way that either Superman, the animated series or Young Justice Lex does. But you're right. She's perfect. The look is perfect. She's like hot chauffeur who can also murder you. It's exactly yes. what it should be. You know, I, my favorite my favorite part is when she walks into the uh, one of the Joker's hideouts with the machine gun. I'm like, oh, <laughs> holy crap. Yeah. Sexy chauffeur for sure, but also, oh my God, she's trying to kill them. Like legit we'll trying, to, trying to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> chauffeur also will murder. Yeah, it's good. Um, and surprisingly, we get not one, but two new looks for Lois in these episodes. And I really like both of them a lot. So what I'm thinking, Joshua, is I think maybe another thing for us to watch is that I, I, I have my hunches 
they're going to experiment with Lois's wardrobe more than anyone else. <laughs> oh, maybe so. Uh, yeah, uh, that I, would be I, good. I had, if I had to guess. So maybe we can add that to a, a, a tally to that as well. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about, uh, of course, we have the purple outfit with the, the, the purple blouse with the skirt. We see her wearing frequently. But maybe let's talk about some of the other. The, what, what's the first new one that you noticed? Well, I, I kind of have referred to it as the backup outfit in our notes, because I do think we see the lavender look for Lois much more often. But we have this almost identical, and maybe it is identical in just a palette swap, into red and black. It's still super professional, but I, I don't know. My first feeling is that they gave her a different outfit that would stand out in a different way, depending on who she was standing next to, you know, like we, we theorized the lavender was supposed to look good next to Superman's blue and red and Clark's blue, you know, this does that same thing, but in a very different way. And I really like it. I like that they actually give her two different looks. Well, and, and, and maybe it, it, it uh, is uh, there to pop a little more next to Bruce Wayne or Batman, right? Again, with right. the, the yeah. blacks instead of the blues and reds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good... Because that's one thing. The red in her outfit will really pop when she's standing next to the extremely boring black-gray blob that is Batman. And when she's standing next to the block of black Bruce Wayne. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, just sure. like his tie does. Just like his tie really pops. You know, even against a white shirt because of how much black there is. Um, now, the other one I noticed for her is her gown that she wears when she's out on the town with Bruce. Oh, yeah. It's exquisite. It's I mean, it's very simple, like so many of the designs in the show. But for my money, it looks like it belongs next to a Bruce Wayne tuxedo. And it also looks like it would legitimately make Lois Lane the center of attention in the right way. I like it a lot. I think, given the uh, the circumstances, uh, I think this is a good little costume. I don't necessarily like. <laughs> we'll, we'll touch on it in a minute. I'm not a huge fan of this subplot, but uh, but you know, I think given that the gown is very pretty, I refuse to hold a terrible subplot against an amazing outfit. I I, I think that's fair. I know absolutely fair. <laughs> I, I I I don't think about when I think about this gown. I th I think too probably a little too much about how crappy this subplot was versus how good the gown looks. So I'll give that to you. I'll give it to you. But Listen, uh, yeah, no, it's a good looking we'll gown. We'll get to that. Oh, we will get to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we have a brand new character, Dan Turpin. Oh, Dan Turpin. Caleb, how familiar were you with Dan Turpin before you came to Superman the Animated Series? At all? I was not at all. I uh, I didn't realize there was such a history with Dan Turpin uh, until after I'd watched the series. But uh, he's a fun character. Uh, and now I did, I did, uh, I, well, I'll let you do the honors of kind of explaining the history there, <laughs> but, uh, all this say is Dan Turpin as a kid watching the show with no knowledge of the comics, you're like, oh, this is kind of, uh, he's like a special kind of cop, right? Um, versus once you start reading into the history there, you're like, wow, there is a lot here. And I'm kind of glad they included this character on the show. He is a really good poll for a lot of meta reasons, um, in addition to him just being a really cool character. And he actually looks really different in the comics than he does on uh, Superman the Animated Series because they were they were homaging a real world person with Dan Turpin. Dan Turpin looks just like Jack Kirby in his 60s. Yes. Uh, if Jack were transported into the animated universe, he would look 100% like and sound 100% like Dan Turpin. And that is... Not an accident. That is deliberate, and it is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, and and then the, I think it'll, it'll be a cool, a cool conversation just to talk about how they use the character throughout the series. Because um, I know they actually come up with some really clever ways, and a lot of uh, nice, touching ways to tribute uh, Jack Kirby uh, through the character of Dan Turpin, which I, I think. Pretty neat, too. One thing we're missing, so I don't want to go too far into this because we will get to her, but one thing we're missing with Dan in this episode is he's normally standing right next to Maggie Sawyer, uh, which we will get to, but she is actually the boss of the cops in Metropolis, and she is a very, like, uh, a serious, you know, by the book, we're going to do it straight arrow, you know, kind of cop, whereas Dan Turpin is the old school, roll up your sleeves, beat the confession out of him if you have to, you know, yep. kind of, actually, that sounds a little too Gotham, but you get what I mean. I, but you know? he does, he now, but he does feel a little bit old school, uh, like in, yeah. in getting the results he needs, and uh, I don't know if Dan Turpin would 
in today's 2019 be considered a good cop. I'll put it that way. But the show likes him a lot, and he means well. So there's those are two honorable traits about him. Actually, let's put him in contrast to Harvey Bullock, okay? The, the difference between what old school means to these two people. Dan Turpin is an honest cop. Okay? Yes, but yes, he, 100%. But he is willing he is willing to kind of get his hands dirty in a way that modern and not dirty, like, like corrupt, just like he walks the beat. He, he is a man who started out walking the beat and rose to be a detective. Right. And that makes a difference, you know? Yeah. And that's also very much in keeping with kind of uh, Jack Kirby's real world, very blue collar roots before he moved into art, you know? Um, and he never really lost that. Like, like uh, uh, Jack always chomped that cigar and talked just like you're hearing Dan Turpin till the day he died. Right, right. So I, I don't want to cast uh, negativity over Dan Turpin because I think Dan Turpin, yes, honest cop, good guy, heart in the right place. But he's seen some stuff and knows that right. sometimes when doing the job, stuff happens. <laughs> and you know? one nice thing, again, we will get to this when we see Maggie, but one nice thing is he also loves and respects Maggie Sawyer as a cop and as his superior. He has no problem working under the command of a woman police officer, and that is pretty great. Yes, yes. Uh, all right, well, I think uh, what we have what, one more design here. We have one more that I just basically wanted to mention because it's so boring. Like, I don't understand. Anyway, it's Undercover Clark. <laughs> uh, so basically Clark with, like, a, a jacket on. In a white yep. shirt. That's it actually got. reminded me of super boring teenage Clark, only with a jacket and minus the red shoes that teen Clark was trying to use as a personality. Mm. Remind me, what is who is the what's the sailor's name who he's talking to, who is apparently a thing in the ship? He is talking to Bibbo Bibowski. Bibbo Bibowski. Okay. Yeah. Right. Again, in the comics, is not a brilliant person, but is a man who has his finger on the pulse of the docks. Uh, and what they call suicide slum, the 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 rougher part of Metropolis. You'll I don't think you ever hear that on this show because they have trouble saying suicide, but right. um, which is probably to the good. But in Metropolis, that area is suicide slum, and so he's never like a guy who's going to sit down and help you with your long division homework. Okay, but he's not a joke. He knows what's going on, and I'm not sure why he became a joke on this show. Yeah, but that's, yeah, he's talking it's... to Bibbo. I, okay, all right, all right. I, I'm going to give Bibbo a little more benefit of the doubt because the first two appearances, I'm like, he's a dumb, dumb punchline. And uh, Oh, yeah, I, that's yeah. his whole job here. And, I, and, and again, just because I come from comic books, I'm like, I don't understand that choice, but okay. okay. All right, well, well I'm, I'm going to play wait and see. I'm sure, I, I'm just hoping that someday on this show, Bibbo is going to do something that I'm like, that's it. This is why you're on this show. You actually have a real purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think he's on for comedy relief. And nah. boy, it's a sad, sad day when Bibbo is much more interesting than undercover Clark Kent. But he is. So now, OK, so that's all the redesign. Good news, friends. We're moving on to talk about the actual episode. <laughs> right. Well, hey, hey, I, again, I think this is a great time to crack open that conversation about the re especially the Batman redesign. So uh, listeners, this was going to happen sooner or later because uh, it's a thing. And uh, I think this is a, a good time to talk about it. Um, you know, though, this is uh, a great episode, Joshua. I, just before we dive into the, the weeds of it, I mean, how do you feel about this as just an episode of tell, Or I, I should just say uh, a three-part episode of television. I actually think it's structured more like a TV movie that they just kind of break into three parts. Less, and less so <laughs> less so a three-part episode. But uh, a th yeah, what, what, what do you got? What do you think? Well, structurally, I think it works really, really well because basically it's act one, two, and three, right? And they just they just break the episodes at the act breaks, which means that we do have some kind of legitimate either cliffhanger or new piece of information that kind of changes the game at the end of each one. But I do think that they definitely had their eye on the fact that VHS tapes and later DVDs of this would be produced all together, you know. I definitely, and I mean, just uh, it, it does. Okay, so circling back to our conversation with uh, our last uh, conversation on the last Senate Krypton, where I was like, this is technically a three part episode, but part one really feels like a standalone versus you know part two it, and three feel like own. a two parter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is definitely a three parter. It, so I, I feel like it's designed to be watched more like in one sitting, uh, but it does work 
at, they all work together in a way. Yeah. Yes. Act one, yeah. act two, act three. Very clear. Um, you know, you have uh, act one, which is the introduction, the setup. You have uh, part two, act two, which is the rise, the payoff to the premise of part one. Uh, that concludes with a twist and cliffhanger, and you have part three, which is the finale. So, like, it yep. works on that front. So, and I think, I think, unlike the the reason I want to kind of high five them for actually making each individual episode work is that it didn't in Last Son of Krypton exactly, and I like that they went to the effort of because the fact is, no matter how many VHSs or DVDs they sold more people were going to see this broken up into three parts right. over three days of their, you know, after school time, then we're going to see it all bundled together. So I really appreciate them putting that work in because can you imagine if the last son of Krypton part one was the episode of Superman that you were going to get on any given Wednesday afternoon, kind of a letdown. Yeah. Part two would have been the, the worst, in my opinion, the worst of the oh, three to yeah. catch on its own. Uh, it's a, yeah. It's, it's, it's rough, but uh, this, though, I do think you get the goods in all three episodes, and they all work They work well enough on their own, but clearly fit together as a, a larger story. Now, I want to say, when we're talking about these, we don't necessarily do beat-by-beats on this show because we assume that our listeners have watched them, right? You know, uh, And I feel like, thematically, these episodes break down into th- three big themes, and I would love to hear what you think about these. But the first one is opposite numbers, and boy, are there a lot of them oh, all yeah. over the place. Yes. The second one is secret identity shenanigans. Boy, do we have plenty of those. And the unexpected one, but it's a theme that just stood out to me, is that we spend this entire three-parter underestimating Gotham City and everyone from it. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I definitely think that the, the the lack of respect for Gotham ties in pretty well because uh and I think that it really folds into in a lot of ways the kind of the opposite numbers pieces because both Superman and Lex think very uh I okay, so Lex says you Joker, you can't even kill a mere mortal, and Joker says there's nothing mere about that mortal, and then Superman wildly underestimates the Joker's uh how clever and creative yes. and um innovative he is with how uh, uh maybe innovative but yeah creative he is with his death traps uh which goes ties into that idea that batman mentions a few times uh always expect the unexpected with the joker and i think the same can uh-huh. be said uh between lex and batman as well yes yeah absolutely well that's kind of the 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 least interesting of the three in my opinion, but it's so prominent that I had to put it in here and we will, yeah, we'll dissect the heck out of that. But I kind of want to start with opposite numbers because that's my favorite. You know how much I love that opposite number jazz. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think this is what's great about bringing these two universes together. You can mix and match <laughs> a little bit. Oh, and, yeah, uh, and it's constant. It's constant. Yes, in, yes. In these, you've got You've got a Joker and Lex comparison. You've got a Harley, Mercy, and Lois comparison. You've got Superman and Batman. You've got Bruce and Clark. You've got Bruce and Lex. You've got all kinds of mix and match opposite numbers, and it is so great. I mean, oh, yeah. my heart sings. Right, right, right. Well, and I mean, uh, I, I think about uh, how well both Bruce Wayne and Batman work with Lex Luthor is fantastic. It's opposite yes. numbers, effective opposite numbers on both sides of the coin. Um, right. Yes. And, I, and I think it, it, touching on like the kind of the thematic under undertone, uh, like the, some of the themes I think are writing underneath this entire three part episode, we're talking about the difference between Metropolis and Gotham. Uh, mm-hmm. You have Batman who takes on the criminal underbelly and the and the the things that are happening in the shadows versus Metropolis, where it's more about restoring the peace uh, than it is like you know uh, uprooting the criminal underbelly. Uh, and you have, I think there's an interesting comparison between Lex and Batman because you have Lex Luthor, who the publicly facing uh, figure, for example. Uh, is just like Bruce Wayne. Yeah, he's a good philanthropist, uh, uh-huh. but his, at nighttime, he's a criminal mastermind running this like crime syndicate and pulling, uh, you know, running all these sort of uh, like bank robberies, uh, villains, like terrorist plots all under the table. While well, you have Batman, who under the table is fighting those as a crime fighter. So I just think all of that works together uh, especially well, um, kind of marrying 
the bright, sunny uh, metropolis, your villains who kind of fight, uh, uh, they, they kind of generally fight it on a playing field of a higher level where it's more about stopping the bad guy, restoring the peace versus Batman, which I think is a little bit more about uh, revealing the dark truths of the city of Gotham or uh, restoring justice to the people in poverty, uh, you know. I, so I think those are some ideas that all kind of come to a head really effectively here. Yeah, I think that the difference between the villainy of Metropolis and Gotham are very typified when you look at Joker and Lex. On the surface, they are very different types of villainy, but yes. when you go underneath, it's like, oh yeah, you guys are just the same. <laughs> you guys yeah. are both pretty terrible. No, they're 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 driven by oh, yeah yeah no I I completely agree they are they are both driven ultimately in my opinion and I'll see what you think I think ultimately both of them are driven by two things greed obvious and ego in one form or another so for example uh, Lex Luthor wants to take credit. And own quote unquote metropolis. He he, he loves mm -hmm. taking pride yes. in how he built half the city, like it's his. Uh, and he wants, and the, his problem with Superman is there's a guy upstaging him and saving yes. the city. So he wants to be the guy. Uh, versus Joker, who also wants to be credit, get credit for being the br brilliant criminal who beats Batman and Superman. It's all about um, receiving credit and notoriety and uh, attention. You know, I, I, so I think. Though Lex might not want negative attention, he wants the attention of a hero while secretly being a villain, while yes. Joker wants the attention for his villainy. So, again, you see both the similarities and the differences and what the – like, at the end of the day, I think they want the same thing, but it manifests itself differently based on the cities and the worlds they're, they're operating in. I think Gotham has a much more overt – sinister look and feel to it just like the joker has a much more i guess authentic or like he owns his villainy it's it's on the outside right and i think gotham's the same way but gotham has this like bright shiny core of batman and robin and gordon and montoya you know um the entire bat family like there's already a bat family there that's like Yes, it looks bad, but at the core, it's good. Whereas Metropolis at this stage is literally the opposite. It looks yes. good and has a cancer in the middle. And that cancer's yes. name is Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and again, I, just a few lines that I thought really highlighted the differences there that uh, that I think are, were really f I actually laughed out loud at both of them. But I think it just so clearly shows the differences between the characters. It's in part three when Lex is about to double cross the Joker and he said, the Joker's like, are you going to kill me? Or Emma Harley says that. And Lex says, no, I would never kill you. I abhor violence. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? And then, but not even five minutes later, you have Joker flying the, the plane that he just had. He, Harley just gave a custom paint job to. And he says <laughs> the line, I love to personalize all of my own stuff. You know, yeah. like it's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I abhor violence. Yet this woman standing next to me with a giant machine gun will do whatever I tell her to do with it. And also you're going to steal my airplane, which is chock full of missiles. Oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's just hidden. It's just hidden. And he's trying to, you know, close these massive billion, multi-billion dollar military contracts. You know, like it's like I abhor violence. <laughs> I love that line. Can we talk about how I low-key love that marrying Lex to the military industrial complex of the USA makes the USA complicit in his villainy? I oh, love it. 100%. I, love no, it. I, I am on board with that 100%. I, I thought that was a great, a nice touch. This universe, uh, and I, we see this here, and I think that the cool part of being in Superman versus Batman is we're starting to see that type of thing, like higher level crime fighting hey, Superman works on a world scale where he actually is interacting with the military more frequently. This is a thing that you deal with in a Superman story that you might not get as much of, at least, in a Batman story on Batman mm -hmm. the Animated Series. Uh, yeah, Lex Luthor working with the government and the show really painting the government as not necessarily evil, but complicit. Because at the end complicit. of the day, uh, the weapons go out to kill things and Lex is trying to make money off of that. So yeah, I uh, I think this universe too, and this is something I want to I want to keep following up on. Generally, does not have a super favorable view of the military at large, and I think it starts here. Definitely not. And boy, watch that continue hard into Justice League. Oh yeah. Oh my. So yeah, but you're right. The seeds are laid here. Like they nobody is overt about that. But but at the same time, you have 
the obvious villain or one of the obvious villains of our piece saying, I want to sell our cool stuff to the military and our obvious hero, or again, one of the obvious heroes saying, absolutely not, you know? And it's like, that says something like a message is being sent with who is delivering which side of that argument. All right. I so think. this actually hits on a couple of things I wanted to touch. I wanted to touch on as well. So let's get into look. Uh, we've, we've talked about like the Lex Luthor Joker dynamic. Let's talk about the Bruce Batman and Lex dynamic because you mentioned this. Bruce Wayne is doing business deals with Lex Luthor, <laughs> and I mean at the end of the day, he he obviously cancels their contract. Uh, and I love the line, sorry, Lex, uh, call, tell your friends at the Pentagon, I don't like guns. I just don't have that kind of uh, creativity. I just don't have the imagination. I just don't have the yeah. imagination. Yeah. Great line from Bruce Wayne. I love it. But that had me begging the question, wait, did Bruce Wayne not scope out Lex, like, sooner? That feels kind of weird. Is that, and, and then that my follow-up question is, if I want to just kind of headcanon this, is this Bruce Wayne slash Batman trying to the the means justify the ends, which is I want to get more inside an inside scoop on what Luther is working on underneath the surface. So he kind of like goes gets into business with him so he can kind of study him that way. Yep. I think that's 100 percent it. I think that that is it. And, and I agree with you that that's a little ambiguous at the beginning. Uh, I did have a moment where I was like, is Bruce Wayne clueless about this? But when when the plot progresses and we see how ironclad he made the contract with LexCorp so that it could not be sold to the military without his knowledge, without Bruce's approval. Right. And I, I feel like that kind of gives us a subtext clue that those contracts are very much meant to allow Bruce into Lex's business, but not allow Lex back into his you know okay. what i mean okay and so yeah. i by the end of this thing i am declaring the entire business deal a batman investigation covered by wayne enterprises right, right. he's like i should probably that like suit the guy's kind of shady let's go ahead and get into a deal with him a deal that by the way i have control over uh, right the the right yeah. Or, yeah yeah or at least veto power right because right. that's all he really needs like if it's a 50 50 deal then that means both of them have to agree and bruce wayne is never gonna agree to give anything to the pentagon ever right right you know right yeah well and i think also you could make the same argument i will make the same argument i don't know if we we can, we can, we can, at least we can get to this. I think he's pulling the same tactic on Lois Lane with their romance. That's how I'm headcanning it. So, oh, um, but, God. Uh, okay. Yeah. We'll talk about that. I actually yeah. think that makes the romance even worse, but we'll uh, get to I mean, it, it, it the does, the but it makes more, bad. It, it does make it worse, but it makes it's more logical. It makes oh. more story sense to me than, than where, it, yeah. Anyway, uh, but oh, yeah, so, that's, oh, okay. I got to put a pin in that because yeah. that's going to make, that's making me physically ill. I don't uh, like that at all, oh, but I okay. get you. I get you, but we'll come, we'll get yeah. to it. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but going back to the Batman Lex thing on the flip side, I loved when Batman broke into Lex's uh, penthouse and interrogated him. That was great. I just loved it. Cause Lex Luthor kind of felt like he was invincible. He was, you know, he was uh -huh. he was trying so hard to keep those worlds separately, and he always felt like he was in control. And all of a sudden, through his own private bedroom, Batman swings in, interrogates him, punches out his uh, bodyguard Mercy, and uh, lay, puts the lowdown on him. I just felt like it was a great Batman and Lex Luthor kind of confrontation. I, one that I am excited to see more of in the future. It is also a really interesting contrast with Superman. Now, obviously, this is from the second season of Superman, the animated series. So nobody was going to, outside of our very weird paradigm, watch Last Son of Krypton and immediately go to World's Finest. But let's look at how Superman ends World's Finest. He flies outside of Lex's office, right, right. outside of his window, will not enter, will not trespass, but is nevertheless making his presence known. And... How much does that on its own stop Lex from doing the thing that he's doing? Not much. Not it really. enrages him, makes him make mistakes, but it doesn't slow him down. Whereas Batman's like, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to scare the pants off of that guy. And then what do you know? He immediately starts making big mistakes. mistakes. Yeah, he calls the you Joker know. again. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not going to try and say uh, we can talk about the difference between like Superman's approach and Batman's approach and how. You know what what that says, because that's another one of these opposite numbers. But I just think it's really interesting, mainly in terms of Lex Luthor. Like 
Superman didn't come in. The fact that he can lift the entire building does not impress Lex because he knows Superman will play by the rules, the obvious rules. But when Batman shows up and is like, I will crash your worlds together, son, do not test me. That's really scary to him right. in a way that Superman is not. And I, I, so it's not like better or worse. It's just really an interesting, you well, know, it, dichotomy. It's, it's different. And, uh, I, you know, I think, uh, it highlights the differences between Batman and Superman and, uh, they do learn from each other in this episode, by yes, the way, absolutely. which is very nice. Yes. Uh, I, you know, because at the mentioning that uh, in part three, they they find out where the Joker's uh, and Lex are at, and they fly there. Superman uses X-ray vision. Ah, lead, uh, Lex, you, you jerk! You got it lined with lead. I can't see through it. And Batman just gives him a look, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I'll tear down the wall." <laughs> you know? Right. And direct Batman just, approach. Sometimes right? the direct approach is good. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's good whenever there's actually real threats. And Batman just says, "Good job. You're learning." <laughs> And, and let's let's lay it out. Gallons of ink and billions of pixels have been spilled about the difference between Superman and Batman. But the thing that I love about them is that all of their differences are very surface. It's actually kind of a mirror to Joker and Lex, really. All right. of our differences are very surface. At the at the center, we are very similar. You know, we are both good men who are using every tool we have at our disposal to do good things. And that looks different, you know, in one identity than it does in the other, but it's still every tool we have. But when you start at the surface, of course, they look like they won't get along, you know. Well, and they, and they well, I mean, let's be real. They do have, and again, yes, people, this is, but nothing we're saying here is world, no, it, every, I, Every eye, it's almost like the the whole, like, what is it, uh, monkeys typing words on a keyboard. It feels like every <laughs> version of this conversation has been had, so I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, overstate this, but I just, their approaches are different. They are fighting for the same ideas from two yes. totally different angles. Yes. The difference is Batman's a willing to, he has, I don't want to say his less rules, he bends, his, he knows when he can bend his rules and when he can't, versus Superman who, you know, has a his own moral code that's a little different and he likes doing things publicly because he sees himself yes. as a symbol uh, to uh, uh, that people should aspire to versus Batman, who is a symbol that criminals should fear, if that makes sense. Yeah. They're both, but they're both fighting for the same thing, right? Absolutely. Look at the difference between Gotham and Metropolis. Gotham wears its corruption on its sleeve, and so therefore Batman has to work underneath to subvert it, whereas Metropolis appears to be bright and shiny. So, so Superman has to be brighter and shinier to inspire those people. He's going to have to be who he is to eventually shine the light on the cancer at the center, Lex Luthor. Whereas right. Batman is going to have to like get under the apple cart to upset it. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. But in their core, it's the same. We're fighting for truth and justice. That's it. That's it. Truth and justice, baby. Yeah, you truth know. and good old, good old truth and justice. But yeah, I uh, I also have to I have to note I loved how they discovered their secret identity shenanigans. Which, by the way, I thought Superman totally cheated. To okay, we talk about Superman having a Cody sticks by. <laughs> he totally cheated on Batman. He did. He didn't even hesitate. He's like X ray vision, Bruce Wayne. And I was like, oh man, you picked the wrong guy. Let's say it like this. You're absolutely right about almost any conversation we could have has been had, but I will say the thing that I like most about the Batman Superman interactions in these three episodes is that they start out deeply disliking one another right. and they play that throughout all three episodes just enough for me to believe the differences about them, but also to believe that they become begrudging friends by the end of this one and then actual friends by the time we see them together later you know yeah. that these three episodes do that perfectly and with that in mind that's why i think that superman did not feel like he was breaking any rules because batman's a dangerous sociopath that needs to be dealt with i'll just see who he is you know because well, it was early on in their relationship I, yeah, so, no, I'm with you. It's cheating, but I also don't think Superman saw it as cheating. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Oh, ooh, that raises a great... This is going to be an ongoing thing with Superman that, that I noticed. He is, of course, the symbol of truth and justice, but, man, he is... He either... He simultaneously lacks self-awareness... Uh, and totally bends his own rules whenever he feels like it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, and I love that. He's like, we don't have, what's the word? He's like, we don't have vigilantes in my city. I'm like, dude, 
What? What? <laughs> you it's, are. Look at yeah. you. Look at you. Now, a thing that I think, and I want to keep an eye out for this um, as we go, actually, uh, uh, this becomes, in our next Superman episode, when we talk about fun and games, this is this is a thing we'll keep an eye on. I think that over time, they do a great job of distancing Superman from crime fighting. Right. Um, and with that in mind, that makes that statement a little less hypocritical. Because at the end of the day, Superman is also p- taking part in vigilantism when he fights crime. But the way that he does it is so different than Batman. Again, I don't think he sees he doesn't see the comparison. No, no, know? no, no. He he absolutely doesn't. And uh, like I, I actually I just I I love Superman. I mean, I love him as a character. Yeah, but, yeah. The, but the thing I like about one of the flaws I deeply appreciate about him that makes him more human is. Um, is even though he is like the symbol of all the things, even he does take shortcuts when it suits him. And it's not as if he doesn't mean anything ill by it, but it's like, he's like in that moment, he's like, ah, well, the right thing to do is just this. And this is what my gut's telling me to do. And a lot of times that gets him in trouble. Uh, and it's a thing yeah, I like, yeah, I, I, can. I, it is a, I, I guess I'll, I'll just say this. I, I have talked to enough people out in the world who think Superman's a really boring two-dimensional uh, character, and I, I, I fundamentally disagree. I think one of the things that makes him human, though, is how he manipulates his moral compass. Like, he is um, – he's the moral standard, so he kind of makes – sometimes will – bend that standard but then say Interesting. Like, it's right because i did it sort of thing you know what i mean like okay it, yeah, it, it, yeah. And, that, and again i don't think this makes him a bad guy because obviously we know what superman stands for makes it great but it is kind of um and, and this is a thing that you'll see throughout the dcau as well whenever put he does make rash decisions sometimes that he justifies to himself later and to other members of the team so it's good i like this about him and it, it does it's not an. It's not that this episode's not about that, but I do think yeah, yeah. It, him working with Batman and criminals like the Joker, who he's not normally used to fighting, kind of has him. You, you already see those kind of character traits come out now and then. So I, I can, I, I can yeah. see that. And trust, trust in Superman is actually one of the ongoing themes of Superman the animated series. And comes to, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but we'll just lay it out. Comes to a surprisingly down note answer. Oh honestly. yeah. Oh. Big time. So, yeah, that's interesting and something to keep an eye on and probably takes us into the kind of more obvious contrast between Bruce and Clark. Um, yeah. So Bruce and Clark. OK, firstly, again, the, we're, we're getting really close to the. This is probably a good segue even into the, the romance subplot that we just have to talk about. But well, OK, then then I want to take a step back and talk about. Harley, Mercy, and Lois. Okay, yeah, let's do that first. Let's do that. Okay. Okay, right. because I love this like contrasting triumvirate uh, because they aren't the same, but they have a lot in common. Like, let's look. These are extremely competent women who, nonetheless, play second fiddle to the men. to the men. And what's what I find interesting there is that like like looking at the at the contrast is Lois does not think of herself as playing second fiddle and maybe we shouldn't either and maybe I just have hundreds of issues of Lois Lane comma Superman's girlfriend in my mind you know um that's not really the modern take on her anymore she doesn't need him it's just nice that he's around right. while at the same time because these are real talk above the line Superman stories she is naturally secondary but then you look at Harley and as we've discussed before, Harley is actually better at the Joker's job than the Joker half the time. And she could absolutely get out from under his shadow and does sometimes, but always winds up back. And then the sort of like darkest version of that is Mercy, who never thinks of herself as in Lex's shadow because she thinks of herself only as Lex's shadow. Like she has no existence other than and to stand Lex. one foot behind and one foot to the left of Lex Luthor. But they you know? deal. Hey, by the way, they do deal with that. Uh, they do deal with yes. that though, and the future. Yes, and we'll talk there about is that. an episode coming. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, so, but yes, as, as well into this particular episode. Yeah, that she does not exist outside of Lex Luthor, uh, and I would say for most of the series, that's that's the case. So I just found I just found that fascinating, especially with how often Mercy and Harley wind up in physical altercation with one another um, and being so evenly matched. And obviously Lois is not 
a combatant in that way, but clearly she is amazing at her job and she is the, exposing a lot of this, you know, a lot of the plot alongside Batman and Superman and Harley and Mercy are the much more obvious opposite numbers in these three episodes. But I, I feel like putting Lois in there just makes that very interesting as a conversation. I, I think so. I think so. Um, so w- with the, the Mercy and Harley piece, there's that scene, I think it's at the end of part two where they start fighting each other while, okay, I have mixed <laughs> feelings about this whole scene. Yeah. On yeah, one hand, it, I it's really, really like that scene, but there I is some to... kind of garbage foundation there. Yeah. 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 Well, it's one of those things where on the surface, I, th- I just think it's comical, right? The, the, the fact they're just, beating the crap out of each other while there's like a serious convo going down. I don't really think it would have, it could have been any character probably, but we know them and like them and have probably, I mean, seeing this for the first time, you're probably like, man, I can't wait to see these two go at each other. So for them to do that at the same time as a more dramatic moment, I think was a, uh, was a fun bit of writing. And I laughed all the way through it, by the way. Uh, that said, uh, you know, two men talking business while the two women have basically like a glorified cat fight. Eh, it feels a little weird. Yeah, it's a thing that I think really works very well with this set of characters, while at the same time, I kind of have to like go, ew, patriarchy. I just, you, you can't help it. It's baked in even though it, the scene actually works with these characters. So, right, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Good touch, though. Um, but, uh, what, okay, so let's circle back. Bruce Wayne, Clark Kent. Here's the line, and I we can talk about all the aspects, but I just think it kind of, all in some ways, even uh, is attempting to highlight the themes of the secret identity opposite number shenanigans. She likes Bruce Wayne and Superman. It's the other two guys she's not crazy about. And right. what I, I read that line because I think there's a pl- really playful uh, competition going on between uh, the two, both Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne. And sometimes it's Bruce Wayne competing with Superman. Sometimes it's Bruce Wayne not even competing with Clark Kent because obviously she's not into him, but right, um, right. kind of like sticking his uh, finger in his eye, kind of, you know, laughing at him sort of thing. There's this weird competition there that carries over into, at least in the earlier, and by the far, I say the first half, the kind of the competition they're having about who's going to bring in the Joker. Right. Yes. Yes. So, I don't know. I, I think it's an awkward way to do it, but I feel like that line does kind of highlight or s- touches on at least some of the thematics we've been discussing. Um, unfortunately, it's, Related to a very subpar subplot that, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's just not good. It's just not good. Yeah, I, I'll say that the the most stark differences, as far as I'm concerned, in these opposite numbers are actually between Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent. Because as as civilian identities, they could not be more different. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, billionaire, handsome, suave, Bruce Wayne's name is known, his face is known. I mean, I'm going to lay it on the line. Clark Kent is a journalist. He's probably working poor. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, He's a good looking dude, but he is not with purpose. Like he's doing it on purpose, but he's not turning heads down the street, you know, in the way that Bruce Wayne would, both in looks and in notoriety. You know, Bruce looks useless and Clark looks very dynamic. And yet... When Lois gets to know Bruce, she thinks he's garbage. Lois gets to know him a little bit and starts to dig him. We'll get to it. I don't buy it either, but we're gonna, we're going with the text as it is, you know. Right. Whereas getting to know Clark makes her respect him more, but not be interested in him at all. And it's kind of interesting to me. I think Clark would actually rather be respected by Lois than loved by Lois. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, totally. But Superman would like to be loved by Lois. See, I think, I, I mean, so without, without kind of pulling them apart into different people, I think Bruce Wayne is realizing he has feelings for this woman and is going to figure out how that works with his whole life later. Whereas Clark Kent is like, I mean, I think I could love her, but I'd really rather have her respect. And the fact that she loves Superman actually gets in the way of that for Clark a little bit, you know, like he cannot act on the romantic stuff as Superman without undermining who he wants to be to her as Clark Kent. Whereas Bruce Wayne is like, my daytime stuff ain't got nothing to do with my nighttime stuff. And that includes you, Lois. Sorry. Which transitions nicely into the garbage romance plot. Yes, Caleb. (laughs) Firstly, we, we just agree. It's a bad romance subplot. Just threw it through. 
There's no it's way she would have. Th- no way that they would have fallen in love that quickly. There's no way that she had. No- How long? I guess if th- did this happen over the course of six months and it felt like a week because it felt like a week maybe. Um, like there's no way it happens that fast. And when they break up, there's not a chance in hell Lois doesn't report. Th- I mean, like th- it wasn't like they've been together for years. Uh, no, it was it's like, terrible. Uh, yes. She would absolutely take advantage of that knowledge. I think. Uh, because I guess if they're, they're I, if they had maybe even spent time with her, like coming to the conclusion that's for the greater good, she not reveal that. Even that would have been better. But she's just like, oh, I guess I can't reveal your identity. I'm like, why not? Why can't you do that? You, in yes. fact, it would only be a. I mean, you're already a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist, but uh, it, this would elevate you to like superstar uh, of superstars, right? Well, and considering that she thinks Batman is a bad person, right. she actually, from a certain perspective, has a journalistic duty to reveal his identity. I would think so. I would think so. Now, now here's here's my take though. Uh I think that well, I think the whole thing is a huge disservice to Lois more than anybody. Uh depending oh, on I agree, <laughs> but I will also say it does nobody any favors, but right. it is the it is so bad for Lois. I agree. Go do go on. I just I, had to say yes. So here's the thing that you kind of like were were squeamish about earlier, and I, I'm going to throw this out there, and you can hate it and not like it. This is just going to be this. This is honestly my reading, and I'm not saying I love it either. I'm just saying it makes the most sense to me based on what we know about the characters, the amount of time this unfolded, and all that stuff. I think that Bruce was playing, or that Bruce Batman was playing her from the beginning. Never actually had any romantic feelings for her, and was oh, using God. and was using the relationship to get closer to the Superman knowledge. And like after, when I was done, I, I I slept on this and thought about it. I was like, no, that seems like the most based on what we see. That seems like the most logical conclusion because even he was like trying to like break it off nicely at the end. But I still didn't buy him saying, "Oh, are you sure you don't want to move to?" Go-? I didn't buy that at all. I did not buy, and all the romantic stuff he drops felt like really easy, like con man esque, like. Uh, seductive one-liners, you know. I, so you can disagree. That's cool. That's and no, it, it, does, it makes that's, Bruce Wayne look bad. But I'm that's, that's what, the worst part. The worst part is as soon as you say that. Okay, so as soon as you say that, just looking at the text that we have. That is difficult. It's not impossible to argue against, but it's difficult. You are actually standing on the better mountain of evidence that that's what's going on and i hate it i just hate it yeah. but it's right i want to write this off with extra textual knowledge like i mean we know we know from other things that uh, the people the the cishet white men who work on this show aren't great at writing women or romance and so i just want to go oh I, i'm going to take this romance at face value but know that it's garbage because the guys who made it are not good at that stuff but if i just take the text you make way too good a point and i'm mad about it this is a very thanks i hate it moment caleb i don't mm-mm. well but it just makes right. it, it well it, it makes it makes bruce slash batman here's the thing I am okay with reading that as a Bruce Batman. I mean, like, it's not flattering. In fact, it's definitely a huge character flaw and a problem. Makes him more problematic. But I also am more okay with... I'm more okay with that. The thing that frustrates me is it makes Lois look really dumb. And I don't think she's dumb. I think the show actually goes out of its way multiple times to show us how smart and uh, and, uh, clever and aware she is of this type of stuff. So it just... I don't know. And then, of course... Uh, the other side of it is, you know, it's a great, if it's a game to Batman, Bruce Wayne, the other part is not only is he doing it to get close to Superman, but for part of it, he's doing it just to like, uh, assert his competence to Superman. Just to alpha male Superman, which is gr- Oh, Caleb, I hate this read. I mean, I'm, you're so onto something, but I absolutely have stomach churning hatred for this read. Like you're, oh. I hate how on point you are right I, now. I don't I, again, like it. Again, I, I don't think it, like, I'm okay with reading these people as a little more flawed, so it doesn't bother me. The Lois is probably the thought part that bothers me the most. No, I agree. Uh, I agree. Um, making Lois look dumb is worse than making Bruce Wayne look like a heel because he actually does that. I, I mean, my feelings about billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne are well known at this stage. I right. hate it. It's the worst. But 
that is a thing because again the people that are making the show don't see it as a problem so that's a thing that gets played with right away in the next batman episode we talk about frankly so i mean yeah that is not doing him any favors but it's also not hurting him any worse than the usual reputation but i agree with you anything you do to make lois look dumb is undermining the entire iconic undergirding of who Lois Lane is. Well, and then and then it You're also so touches right, on. You're so right, and I hate you for it. Oh, my God. This <laughs> show is over. I'm, I quit. I, I'm I quit. sorry. An animated no, 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 discussion quit. is over. Oh, my no. God. Now, please, please. Uh, okay, one last thing to upset you. Not because you're wrong, but because you're right. <laughs> I, I'm oh. sorry. I, well, one other piece I have to throw out there, too. The alpha male piece, it makes Superman jealous slash assert himself in ways that he probably wouldn't normally yes um yes. which you know again i think that the thing is i like the dramatic tension it creates between batman and superman i like kind of the cat and mouse game we get out of it the thing that's problematic though is it, it comes to the sacrifice of lois lane like it, i wish they could have come up with another way to create this tension that would work for both characters both identities too you know so yeah yeah it's a shame that some of the stuff I like came at the cost of something that I feel like is a massive disservice to yes. one of the most iconic characters in the show. So, Yeah, a great deal of character things are sacrificed on the altar of let's get a romantic subplot in here when the subplot is not well executed, not necessary, and really causes a bajillion more problems than it solves. And as long as I'm being super petty about it, let me also say that this is the first of at least two times that these shows decide that capes are stupid and I'm salty as hell about it and I'm not going to put up with it. <laughs> I'm mean, not going to put up with it. Capes I will not cause hear problems. it. Capes can cause problems. It happens sometimes. You uh, know. Not in superhero stories because they're <laughs> about how things feel, not how things actually are. I suspect that dressing up like Dracula is not the best way to handle crime in the real world nevertheless it is 100 percent the best way i'm just saying stop it you guys you're not doing yourselves or any favors and i will come to your house and talk mm, to you about mm, capes mm. oh all right all right well but but and and the fact that messing with the cape is a doorway into the worst part of the lois bruce relationship where she's like and i can't do anything about it why not sister yeah it's bad it's yeah bad. Like also that reveal was dumb all around I mean, yes. I, I mean, fine. The cape getting ripped off uh, that didn't bo that didn't bother me. I just thought like the reaction to the whole thing was really dumb. Uh, yeah. Again, I just didn't. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't buy the relationship from the get go. So therefore, it feels like Lois is like, oh my god, Batman is Bruce Wayne. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, and I can't do anything <laughs> about it. What? No, that's not true. It was like the writers were also going, oh, no, what do we do with this? In the same time as Lois is asking, what do I do with this? And mm. for contrast, we talked about it a little bit, but for contrast, how ham-fisted the reveal of Bruce Wayne's identity to Lois is compared to how masterful the mutual secret identity reveal is between Batman and Superman. Oh, it's and great. How, and how much the way that that reveal goes down and their entire initial interaction starts an arc for them as I want to say as a couple, like as a bromance, it starts an arc oh, that's oh, not definitely. over at the end of these episodes. It's not no. over. No, 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 not at all. And that's why I love this. It it feels like the beginning of, hey, we're not necessarily friends per se, but I respect what you do. And maybe yes. we'll work again in the future. And obviously that's going to go places. I loved the reveal. I love that Superman, again, kind of like asserting his own moral compass in the that he felt mm -hmm. in the moment to find out who Bruce Wayne is because this guy doesn't belong in my city. I got to find out who he is to get him out. And then on the flip side, it was such a perfect Batman reveal for him to like place the tracker on Superman and Superman be totally clueless. I loved it. This is what detective work looks like, Superman. You and know? I, I, yeah. Again, it's that weird kind of like co competition that I think is uh, uh, fun and playful when you see what, when you're not doing the romance stuff, but when it's really fun and playful when Superman's like, crap, he knows who I am. And you just look across the way, like a mile away, you got Batman with binoculars waving at him. I just, I thought that was great. Man, yes. And, okay, I feel like that's an excellent segue into the entire idea of underestimating Gotham. Because of that bromance arc definitely starts with a lot of underestimating of Gotham and ends with them kind of seeing each other as peers. You know, like both Metropolis and Gotham, Batman and Superman, Clark and Bruce. You know, everybody is starting to see themselves as, as peers. But it is so 
in your face, like right from the very first minute that Lex is talking to Joker, that he doesn't respect Batman. And I don't think he entirely respects Joker. And it's only the fact that Joker has like 100 pounds of kryptonite that he's like, all right, let's see what you got. Right. You know? No, no. Well, again, it's it's the constant underestimation. And yeah, I think it's uh, also, again, opening up this, this larger world that like, oh, Gotham problems can actually become Metropolis problems. We're, this is why we got to work together because... You know, so what? So say Batman succeeds and he either locks up or runs all the criminals out of Gotham. Well, the ones that get away are going to go somewhere else. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's as, uh, they have to work together in order to actually re- solve the problem in a lot of ways. Uh, in both yeah, cities, yeah. both cities, yeah. And what's, what's sort of fascinating to me is that this underestimating of one another seems to permeate every level, right? Because we have Lois thinking Bruce Wayne is trash and uh, everybody thinking Batman is a sociopath and Lex thinking Joker can't get the job done, but okay, go give it a shot. And Lex underestimates Batman and gangsters in Metropolis don't know who Joker is. That is strange. I wonder, does Metropolis not even report on Gotham stuff? Like that stuff's crazy and we're not touching it. Because that's kind of an interesting accidental world building piece too, right? If Metropolis is like, that town is nuts, we don't even talk about it because we will sound like a tabloid if we do. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and you, you know, again, the, the weird underestimation maybe you could even tie to economics as well. Like, uh, sure, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Like New York City says, we're too good. Uh, we're 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 too good of a city for maybe someone like Baltimore or Boston or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah, there. That's a real thing that happens. And I'm not. Hey, for any of our New York listeners out there, I'm not speaking. All that's just a base surface level example, though, right? I I have been to cities where people are like, my city is better than your city because we don't have your crime problems. Yeah. Um And uh, what this highlights, I think, is that. We all got problems. All cities got problems. They just look a little different. And to your point, going uh, circling back to what you talked about earlier, it is great contrast. Gotham is ridden with crime on the surface, mm-hmm. uh, but you have people working beneath the surface to make it right. Versus Metropolis, which you said is 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 rotting on the inside, despite looking like this huge, uh, almost dystopia uh, on the sh- show. So I mm-hmm. again. Uh, the underestimation there, I think, highlight could you could even if you want to chase that rabbit, talk about the socioeconomics uh, uh, of the situation uh, and of uh, the economy of different cities could be a part of that. Yeah, could be a part of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and what's so fascinating to me is that I think that Joker and Batman both know this and use it. I mean, Joker very nearly kills Superman. Would have killed Superman if Batman hadn't been around. One hundred percent. And it's only possible because Superman so mightily misunderstands the threat of the Joker. Like, he shows up in his anti-kryptonite suit like that's the only problem there's going to be, you know? And Joker makes fun of him about it when he's like, oh, what? Ah, I didn't expect this. Oh, wait, never mind. I remember I have acid. Like, it's the only reason Joker can get as far as he does in his plot is because everybody thinks Gothamites are idiots who don't know anything. And both Joker and Batman use that to their advantage right up until they stop, you know, because both of them just turn the tables where Batman's like, I'm gonna break into Lex's bedroom. And Joker's like, that's it. We're stealing your airplane and blowing up your city. I don't like you. Right, right, right. Yeah. You will not be underestimating us next time, the Gothamites seem to say. (laughs) Right. Well, and uh, I, I want to use the kind of maybe wrap, wrap down the conversation by talking about this idea of the interconnected universe. And yes. Um, so as we said at the end of the episode, you kind of have this, they're planting the seeds for the bigger things to come. You've got, okay, hey, we now we know who each other are. Maybe not friends, maybe kind of more like acquaintances or uh, colleagues, but uh, you know, I respect you enough that we, we, yeah, we can do this again. And it really... This episode couldn't have happened without, A, a successful run on Batman the Animated Series that started it all. Yes. Which, by the way, they weren't, when they wrote out Batman the Animated Series 92, they weren't like, all right, guys, so we're going to have 
in five years, we're going to do a crossover <laughs> episode with Superman. It was just, hey, we're going to tell some great Batman stories. And then once they got done with that, they moved on to some Superman stories. And then after a season of Superman, they're like, hey, what if we cross over these universes? Because we're going to have to roll out a newly designed Batman anyway, because they want because uh, WB wants more episodes. So you get that crossover there. And then later down the line, they say, hey, those crossover episodes did so well. Let's look at a Justice League and a Batman yeah. Beyond. And it's all vo- very organic. And I just want to remind listeners that when Marvel came out with the cinematic universe in 2008, when they released Iron Man, yes, there was a post credit stinger with uh, Nick Fury that was added on last second, by the way. Uh, yeah. Kevin Feige wasn't like, all right, guys, so phase one's going to be this, phase two's going to be this, and then eventually we're going to have Infinity War. No, no, no. This It was very organic. It was, hey, let's make a great Iron Man movie. Let's throw in maybe, uh, like, plant some seeds, throw in some Easter eggs, and we'll see what we can do with it, right? What, see, what, see what the success brings us. And from there, it just kind of organically evolved. And all the, they just said, hey, we're going to make, we're going to try to make a good Thor, a good Captain America. Uh, our goal, it's a movie by movie basis. And as they saw the success of those different films, they, they slowly started building towards a crossover. It wasn't as if when they released Iron Man, they said, all right, in five years, Avengers is coming out. No, it mm-hmm. was more like, we're going to focus on one story at a time. So I don't know, obviously, I don't know Kevin Feige. I don't know exactly how this, his process evolved into building you know, this empire uh, of Marvel films. But I do look at the two, the the DC animated universe and the MCU and see a lot of similarities in the playbook, which is just, they focus on story first, executing a a great story that people want to watch and they give people more of it. And they leave plot threads open, not necessarily knowing 100% what they're going to do with those, but knowing we're going to come back to this. And then when the uh, opportunities arise, they they build things out and they build the crossovers in, and then it grows out organically, which a whole other conversation, maybe a whole other podcast, it really has me scratching my head as to why DC never really figured out the secret to Marvel, what Marvel did, because they'd already done it on television like a decade and a half before. Oh, you mean cinematically. Yeah. They've done it twice, my friend. They did it once with all the animated stuff. They've done it again on the CW. And we can have a conversation about the overall quality or lack thereof or wherever you land on the CW stuff. But you cannot deny the unexpected and yet very clean world building they did from, oh, Arrow's actually successful? You guys want to try the Flash? And now we have a universe, a multiverse, you know. Yeah, they've literally done it twice, but they can't do it in the cinematic universe. And I mean, this is a bigger conversation, so I'm going to say this is probably a place for us to have that conversation elsewhere. But the flag that I plant is, that's what happens when you hire people who think superheroes are stupid to make superhero stuff. Right. Right. Well, yeah, I think that's a good point because the people working on the television stuff actually seem to genuinely love the characters Yeah, if they aren't comic book people themselves, they understand that there's something there worth finding out about, like figuring out and translating. And in the case of uh, BTAS, these were guys who knew that stuff already. They, They were already comic book guys. I think in the case of the CW, they were people who were like, we know there's something of value there. Whereas cinematically, they want to run from that as hard as possible, at least until recently. So, yeah, that's a good... mm. Let us know, listeners, if you would like uh, some sort of patron exclusive or a secondary conversation where we kind of compare and contrast the well-done nature of several of DCs. I mean, in fact, I'll say I kind of think that the world building and cohesiveness of the animated universe and the CW universe is better than the cohesion of the MCU. Oh, I know. I agree. I actually prefer. Yes. No, I 100 percent agree. But it's not shade on the MCU. Like they've done a great job, but the the you can't see the seams as well. In this other stuff, I think. Well, so. and, and again, this is this is the benefit of having more time in television. You know, like it's absolutely not, yeah. A movie does not equate making one movie does not equate to uh, making a television show. You have, I think, you actually have. It's easier to cover the seams in television. There's more time, more episodes. Yep, uh, I agree with that. The movies. So anyway, side note: this is the beginning of what would become a very effective and memorable, and I would say one of the best cases for how to build out uh, an interconnected universe with your characters. So, Yeah, I agree with that. Well, Joshua, I think that's, uh, that, uh, that's about all I have on World's Finest, uh, other than to say uh, it's a terrific episode, 
and people should absolutely check it out if they have any interest. I, I would even show this to somebody who hasn't seen either series. Honestly, it's that good. Um, though I will say, side note, we didn't talk about it. It's really not worth spending that much time talking about. I still think fighting robots is really lame, but that's another conversation we can talk about well, another day. Well, okay, let's finish it out with the one downside of this thing is that the robots make a really good tub of plot spackle like what brings it all together, but right. fighting a bunch of robots in an almost nondescript airplane is not exactly at the level that we would want from Superman and Batman. I, yeah. I, I think that's fair. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Joshua, as always, let's go ahead and wind down the show with some alternate media recommendations. So for people who enjoyed World's Finest, what are some other things they can watch, play, read, uh, or whatnot? What, what do you got for us today? Well, here is my big reveal, and you are going to flip out. Okay, I'm listening. Friends, I did not go and make an individual episode list because I would have to do a bunch of rewatching that I don't want to do, but I'm going to tell you that the best thing you can watch if you enjoyed World's Finest is all of the Lois and Oliver Queen parts of Smallville Season 6. <laughs> it's pretty great. It's pretty great. I love all that stuff. I love uh, I love the crossover shenanigans on Smallville. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Joshua's giving a Smallville recommendation. I can't believe it. Well, yes, I am. I can't well, believe it. Well, yes, I am. But let's look at it. Let's look at why, right? Like, Oliver Queen, the green arrow on Smallville is basically Silver Age Batman. And yeah. he is amazing at it. And I really like Justin Hartley in that role. Yep. And Erica Durant's as Lois Lane is my bar none, no two ways about it, number one Lois Lane in any media. Like that's a, Dana Delaney on this show is a close second, but Erica Durant's is my number one. And when you have th that love triangle between Oliver, Lois, and Clark works so much better on that show than the one that they tried to shoehorn into this, including the secret identity shenanigans, I might add, that while I feel it's a little bit trolling you, I also have to say that stuff is really good. No, that, <laughs> that stuff part is of really that good. season is really it, good. And you know what? It even hits some of the, actually not some of, it hits several of the same beats now that I'm thinking about it because I just think to remember Clark being really upset and annoyed that there was a quote unquote vigilante in Metropolis. Uh -huh. I'm like, Clark, you don't, you're not even Superman yet. Yeah, you're a vigilante. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 I agree. So the two things that Smallville somehow accidentally falls backwards into doing better than Superman the Animated Series is Erica Durant's Lois Lane and the love triangle between Clark Lois and Oliver Queen. It's fantastic, highly recommended, but don't actually watch every episode of season six. Just look for the best Lois and Oliver I, stuff. I, I disagree. Season six is a great... Season five and six, I think, uh, of Smallville. If I was going to just pick two seasons to recommend to people, those would probably be... The, maybe maybe some season four, too. There's some weird stuff in all of those, but I like season five and six quite a lot because you start to see where uh, characters actually start to, to change and shift. I think that subplot is quite a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, Michael Rosenbaum's Lex Luthor is always going to be a favorite of mine. So he got that right. Well, you know what? That interaction between Michael Rosenbaum's Lex and Justin Hartley's Ollie is not bad, but but it is nowhere near as good as the Bruce Wayne Lex Luthor stuff in World's <sighs> Finest. They're different. different now I different. can't. Now I can't stop comparing them. But I'm going to stop comparing them because Caleb, what are your alternate media recommendations? All right. So I've got one that's serious. Uh, two, I'll, I'll even say two that are serious, one that is absolutely not serious, but it ties into the era at which this aired. So, first and foremost, Who Framed Roger Rab Rabbit? Now, for a lot of us who have been around the block a few times, this seems like an obvious choice. It's like one of the ultimate crossovers. They have all these different cartoons. You've got Disney characters. You got, uh, sorry, you've got like your your Bugs Bunny. You've got all these characters um, from around the universe at the time. Like, all these different anime characters worked into a detective story. Um, and multiple animation styles, all filmed kind of on screen, green screen at the time. It was a huge technical innovation. It's just, it's hard to beat that level of comparison. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, kudos to Steven Spielberg for pulling that together. Uh, I think they had, it was like Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, Duff, uh, Ducks, uh, Daffy Duck, Donald Duck, all of them in the same movie with the rabbit, all that stuff was kind of wild. Uh, so that ties into Ready Player One, which is a significantly less good movie, but does a similar thing, uh, what brings a lot of folks in. Not not great, not as good, but uh, or as iconic or as innovative, but still a fun time if you like the pop culture crossovers. And then last but not least, I have to mention, I mean, if we're thinking about crossovers, 
from the 90s television, designed for children, there is no greater crossover than Power Rangers in Space, where the Power Rangers meet the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the live-action versions. Let me tell you guys, this was awful and beautiful and hysterical all at the same time. Don't watch it unless you really just want to like what did crossovers in the 90s look like this one i remember that existed now was like holy crap this was a terrible and kind of perfect idea it was power rangers in space and the episode was called shell shocked and the oh my god the ninja turtles get brainwashed by the bad guys so yes the power rangers in fact do fight the ninja turtles in in this episode uh yeah, don't watch it. It's bad unless you really want some hardcore '90s nostalgia uh, coursing through your veins. Uh, don't watch it. But it's a it's it's a fun thing that happened about the same time. It's so rare to see two companies so blatantly look at one another and go, "You want to do a cash grab? Yeah, but let's not do much work on it." That about wraps it up for this animated discussion. If you enjoyed this conversation and would like to join in, come find us on Twitter. Caleb is at Seamasters Talk, and I am at Joshua Unruh, and the hashtag is Animated Discussion. Caleb, where else can people find you? Uh, well, I am uh, the editor-in-chief and a contributor at the Cinematropolis, uh, a website that specializes in in-depth film critique and analysis. Uh, we also have a monthly podcast called The Cinematic Schematic, where you can hear uh, myself, Laurent Chapman, and any number of other guest hosts talking about some of the best and worst movies released that month. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can find all of that over at thecinematropolis.com. Remember that an animated discussion is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. Show your support by pledging at Patreon or by leaving a great review on Apple Podcasts to make it easier for more people to find us and join in the discussion. Uh, of course, you can find the links to Patreon, Apple Podcasts, uh, our recommendations, and Twitter. They, they're all going to be easy to find in the show notes. And uh, we just have to say thank you so much for joining us for this animated discussion uh, discussing uh, World's Finest. We'll be back next time when we head back to Batman Animated Series uh, or the new Batman Adventures uh, by discussing the first episode, weirdly, Holiday Nights. So we'll see you back here. Same bat time. Same bat channel.